Hello, viewers. This is the first discussion of 2022. Uh, here with me today, I have Stephen Dunn. Um, I've recently made friends with you, Stephen, and it's a pleasure. Um, and we're all mutual. We're mutual friends of uh, Eric Evans, uh, Seth mm -hmm. Gillian, who I've had on both. I've had on the channel before. Um, mm -hmm. And in today's discussion, we're just going to have a relaxed conversation about Kierkegaard and his works. Um, and Stephen is um, very educated on Kierkegaard. Uh, you do these lectures. Um, you have a YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a lot of content on Instagram, I notice, as well. Yes. Instagram for me is just more of a kind of playing ground for getting uh, a good understanding of my audience, what they react to, what things stick, what things don't. And so my real interest has to do with my writing platform. Anyway, I won't go into too much, but and I kind of playing around in different areas, but Instagram seems to be one significant sort of battlefield of activity, as it were, that gives me a good gauge of the social media conversation. So anyway, that's just kind of why. Yeah, I'm no, there. Instagram, Instagram is, is a good way of um, doing things. I mean, some OGs of my, <laughs> my content, um, I started off on Instagram for mm. A few years actually before I ventured to YouTube um, and I, I think yeah I sent you the post that I sent today but I <laughs> I started with quotes um, you know mm, sure sure doing doing an analysis of them and um, and now I don't do that as much because I'm you know contending with doing other content on YouTube mostly um, mm -hmm. and yeah I, I do agree Instagram is really good um, but as shown in this discussion you know one-to-one -one conversations you can't beat that so yeah if you could sort of um, introduce yourself briefly and what kind of work uh, you do uh, considering uh, philosophy and other subjects um, yeah just a brief overview of course a number of different ways I can introduce myself I can I do the normal sort of introduction in saying that I'm the author and creator of a philosophy of religion blog as well as podcast known as the instant but as far as the accolades or achievements on my behalf as an author I'm sort of one who understands himself as kind of just a midwife in the maiutic process of religious communication. So in other words, it's just in the same way that Socrates kind of stood outside of the sort of knowledge teacher learner relationship by, you know, birthing, you know, the process of knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in the same way that I try to step aside as author in this uh, religious communication dialectic. And so uh, a lot of the work that I'm concerned with on my channel is this notion of you know, religious communication, spiritual psychology, what it means to be a spiritual observer. And so a lot of my work uh, piggybacks, you know, a lot of the analysis from certain existentialists usually associated under that camp is Soren Kierkegaard. So, you know, no surprise that, of course, you know, we're here, of course, talking about that guy. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the extent of my work and how I would introduce myself. I'm a writer or a commentator. I'm by no means a Kierkegaard scholar or anything in that regard. Uh, I've just read him extensively, very, very seriously, and it's gotten to a point of me interacting with certain prominent scholars in the field, uh, having certain discussions with them, uh, exchanging papers and stuff like that. So it's been uh, it's been a fruitful past few years in that regard. Yeah, no, I mean, from from looking at your your content um, overall, it, it does seem to me that you, I really like how you, how creative you are with how you post. I mean, your stories on Instagram, for example, are very in depth. Um, and there's a lot of information there. And it, it's quite wide as well, the array of subjects that you talk about um, in relationship mm. to Christianity um, and spirituality, religion, uh, critical thinking, um, other other sort of political issues as well, you know, mild political issues that kind of link with um, mm. these subjects. And it, it's just really cool. I, I love the, um, again, the backgrounds um, and just the whole aesthetic is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, Bless you. I mean, That's very kind of you to say. Even your profile picture of the black and white, you know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's really, it's really, really cool. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, so I, I want to go into um, your journey, let's say, because mm. on your YouTube, there's a video um, of you discussing how you were actually an atheist um, yeah. and now you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of the audience and of course for me as well, um, how did that how did that begin like what what was it that i guess made you an atheist at one point but then you became convinced otherwise yeah. so yeah if you could just talk us through that process yeah for sure 
um, you know, <laughs> one of the funny things when I was thinking about this story is that usually within the Protestant community, there's this language of sharing your testimony, uh, you know, identifying a certain moment of faith experience of when, you know, I look back and I pro provide an account of some being affected by divine grace. So I refer to, you know, maybe my baptism, maybe a certain long process that happens. Um, and for me, as I've gotten older and experienced, you know, God in this life, especially in my early years, I'm only 27 years old. A lot of these things uh, happened when I was about 15, 16, 17. And so if we're going to talk about my atheism, I wouldn't give any, you know, special substance or credence to it because it wasn't an intellectually robust atheism. I mean, like I said, I was 12, 13, 14, 15. I grew up in a primarily secular home. My parents didn't go to church. We didn't talk about church. And then my brother came under some religious experiences for himself that kind of had us bumping heads for a little while. And one important experience that I remember having with Kevin, my brother, you know, I sat him down at a table and I had this sheet of paper I put in between him. I don't remember if I talked about this in my testimony, but it just stands out. Um, I put a piece of paper between us where I said Santa Claus and God. And I drew a line down the middle and I said, could you just tell me the differences between these two figures? And, you know, as I look back on that interaction, I understand it more as a desire to ask the deeper question, which is, what is the difference between this object of my imagination? Uh, you know, how is my imagination different from the essence of God, this divine reality? I think that was the underlying existential interest in that interaction. But of course, as Christians usually do, as apologists normally do, we talk about the material constituents of the conversation. Well, Santa Claus, you know, comes from this historical story X centuries ago. He's not really omnipresent. He's not really all-knowing. And here's the argument X, Y, and Z, and evidence and proof, you know, ABC to describe that. Um, and so anyway, I think early on, you know, as time goes on, I develop a sensibility for religious things. And then I, some more happenings, you know, take place. Um, you know, to my, my shame, I read Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis, uh, a book defending young earth creationism, and I was I was sold. Um, I was more so playing with doubt rather than actually being in doubt, and I was just kind of like that doubting Thomas and saying, like, unless I stick my finger in that side and feel that scar, I'm not going to believe. And so uh, anyway, um, religious experiences happen. 16 years old, I encounter apologetics and the arguments for God's existence. That envelops into a love for philosophy, and then the rest is kind of history. So here I am almost 10 years later now still talking about apologetics philosophy and all that kind of stuff, but with some import from Kierkegaard and, you know, other thinkers who have been important along the way. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's me, I guess, as far as the whole atheism story. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because the theists often get a bad rap for not being critical in their upbringing or, or being, um, mm. theist that sort of, like the atheist would typically say, well, you know, you, you were born, you were born um, with, with that sort of family and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore that assumes that if anybody <clears throat> is a theist, let's say, um, then that that must mean that they haven't thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I, will, I submit um, at this point that it goes both ways, you know, like like atheists can have low resolution thinking. You know, and arguments can be low resolution. And like you were saying, that is that is more or less what, what you believed your atheism was, um, because like the theist being brought up in the household, you, you were brought up um, sort of in a nonchalant, well, way about it. And, and it, it didn't immediately mm. um, address you as something to join in with. Um, and so, yeah, I think it goes both ways, that kind of claim. Um, atheists can a priori be in that club as well as theists yeah um, it's one of those sort of double standards that um you know pop atheists um <laughs> like to say that the genetic fallacy for example um is, is a common mm -hmm. one uh that they that they vi violate so i'm interested why kierkegaard because that is a topic of this mm -hmm. discussion overall and to kick it off, why Kierkegaard? Why should we care about Kierkegaard and his work? 
You know, there's a lot of things I would say uh, in answer to that question, um, but I'll kind of piggyback it in response to kind of what we're talking about here. You know, in usual, just to skip ahead as far as some concepts of Kierkegaard for the audience who has some familiarity with his thought, there's the usual understanding of him talking about these stages of existence, right? These spheres or these existence possibilities, and particularly that there's three of them, the aesthetic, the ethical, and then the religious. But then he says that between each stage, there's a kind of boundary point between them. So between the aesthetic over into the ethical, it's irony. So when Kierkegaard wants to bring about the contradictions of the aesthetic, the erotic, the life view, which is so concerned with living in the moment and only being concerned with, you know, fleeting pleasures, uh, the devices that he used in his authorship is uh, devices of irony. Anyway. So the, the boundary point between the ethical and the religious is comedy or humor, says Kierkegaard, because the religious person in this kind of hidden inwardness, um, whenever it tries to be expressed in an outer kind of way, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's comical. So Kierkegaard looks at those certain theologians and scholars and professor, professors and intellectuals who try to uh, elucidate these divine realities, these truths of the faith, these spiritual becomings, as it were, and present them in the form of philosophical proofs or demonstrations. And in that way, they've made their entire thought project as uh, as humorous or as comical. And that, that is to say that he says that these sort of life views end in comedy. Now, that's interesting. That's a funny thing to say uh, as far as how certain people carry themselves. But with Kierkegaard, you get a sort of psychologically uh, – a psychological attentiveness to these moves that take place in the religious life. So Protestants, I would say apologists and evangelicals generally have this understanding of faith experience as being like a progression from unfreedom, from bondage, from slavery to that of freedom, grace, and salvation. So that's why I talk about how Protestants have this language of their testimony as being like a moment. They're being shifted over. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, an instance in life that accounts for their being in the faith. But Kierkegaard does away with that vacuousness of thinking of the moment as being eternally significant for this total life experience, which is faith, such that he says that really God relationship, God experience is progressive over a life view. And so in insisting that view of the God relationship, he makes a distinction between knowledge-based views of life and of the divine and what we can call ethical or artistic views. And I'll finish here so as not to drag this. But basically, life views which are so concerned about knowledge, knowing things about God's existence, merely studying your Bible and knowing the translations, uh, this is what apparently makes you uh, a religious believer. Um, he's saying that this view of life is having existence beaten into a person. So, you know, a person who wants to study a certain textbook in order to pass the class they have to kind of beat this knowledge into them, right? But think of a life view where ethics is instead beaten out of a person. When an authority figure in the military looks at a certain frail, kind of weak person and says, I see a soldier in that person and I'm going to beat it out of them. So he offers this life view of existence, of the human situation, as human existence being like an art, being oriented towards a production not remaining stuck within yourselves in this vague religiousness, which has no relevance or intelligibility for anybody, uh, but one is infinitely and passionately involved in the stuff of faith. And anyway, just to finish there, it's, it's so is this, my preoccupation with Kierkegaard is that he has uh, a, an insistence upon looking at man's situation, um, giving an existential hermeneutic, to, pro to use a difficult phrase, to the stuff of theology, and I think that is the proper procedure in order to even communicate the faith, to even talk to atheists or unbelievers or what have you. So that's why I love Kierkegaard, because he's one helpful means in articulating this philosophy of existence, in other words. so Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I what, when I read uh, Fear and Trembling, what mm. stood out to me was how kind of like what you said how well he translates the ideas to both theists and atheists mm. right? because he speaks in language that we can kind of understand in the sense that like you know the leap of faith for example for example like 
he's on the side of rationalism himself when he advocates that because he's like yeah okay guys like this this is a leap of faith right and and mm. we have to we have to reserve um our epistemology um in some sense to to do this um because mm -hmm. you know one could say well how would you know whether that's the best choice and well he would say well it's, it's a cumulative case of um uh, understanding the, the arguments and so on and so the leap of faith is mm. is more of something that you trust depending on your other sets of knowledge um and what the rationalist can't necessarily get over and look, i i personally with his idea i respect it and and i respect it because as i said he does actually um it, it does involve like he does critique it um mm. you know like pascal with pascal's wager for example like he he is so, like pascal was so great in looking at both sides of the argument you know um and, and he and he talks about uh, islam um other religions and and the way that he deals with it, Kierkegaard, it, it felt similar to Pascal in the sense that they're both that they're both looking at both sides of the argument. Um, mm. they're, they're not just ignorant to 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 uh, one side. You know, it's they're careful thinkers, and and that's why he's respected in the same light as uh, uh, Nietzsche. Because and I, I want to also ask you um, regarding mm. Kierkegaard in, in the sense that. You know, he's labelled as an existentialist philosopher. Mm. Now, I, I've heard some contention around that. Like, you know, yes. what are your thoughts on that label being attributed to him? Uh, yeah, so a number of different things, I would say. So first and foremost, when you look at the early existentialists as we understand them, so Gabriel Marcel, Carl Jasper, Jean-Paul Sartre, Camus, Martin Heidegger, uh, all of them, probably with the exception of Sartre and de Beauvoir, they all rejected that title of existentialism. Uh, it's a very important move that's insisted upon these kinds of thinkers because they're not concerned with a school of thought per se. And so Kierkegaard in the same fashion uh, has a kind of repugnance for this kind of school of thought or systematizing such that it goes back to that earlier thought where I mentioned where if you appropriate Kierkegaard's thought as a system of thought, where we organize concepts towards a you know a consistent framework or worldview, uh, it ends in the comical. It's it's something to be laughed at, and so my answer, long story short, is yes and no. No, in the sense that he ha would have an emphatic insistence uh, in distancing himself from any sort of philosophical school, but yes, in the sense that technically I understand an existentialist to be someone who opposes more essentialist views of life. So we know this in his reaction to Hegel. Um, and his existentialism is a reverting away from a, a moving away from the particulars or looking away from existence to the world of ideas, to essences. And anyway, so existentialists know in the sense that, you know, Kierkegaard is not to be conceived as part of some school because he doesn't want to be. And he says that specifically himself. Uh, but yes, in that he does exhibit characteristics which have some relevance to what we what we call uh, an existentialist analysis. So, mm, yeah, it it kind of reminds me of the similar issue <laughs> with um, people calling them like themselves writers or or, or um, I don't know philosophers because both of those terms. I mean, I consider myself a writer, but mm. some people out there would say well you need to have written like 10 books before you're a writer or some people say oh you're a writer but you're not an author you know and mm. and it's when <laughs> it's when the semantics just gets a bit messy because on the other hand as well like i would say and the definition of a philosopher just just to go more on the semantics of of, of these issues like mm. the definition of a philosopher is simply someone who is a lover of knowledge by definition mm. and and you know and i I guess by definition, I consider myself a philosopher, but there are people out there, namely scholars, I expect, because they didn't get their degree for nothing, I, I suppose. Um, but that they would say, well, actually, somebody has to have this certain qualification to be called a philosopher. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the whole mm. semantics behind it as, as well, because um, I mean, the Camus example is the same, as you said, like, because he rejected um, the idea of um, well, people have called him all sorts of things. I mean, existentialist, nihilist, which nihilist right, right. wouldn't make sense at all, really. 
um, even Nietzsche, like calling him, him, him a nihilist. I mean, he, he talked about the subjects, but that doesn't mean that he was a nihilist, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, although I must admit, out of a lot of uh, thinkers, Nietzsche actually embodied what he what he believed um, yeah. quite, quite a bit. Um, I, I do want to go into the leap of faith idea because you know I'm mm, sure. I'm not. Uh, I'm not as uh, well read on Kierkegaard as you, and and that's kind of the the reason for us discussing this, because you know, I want to learn, and the audience, um, I'm sure, will be interested in in learning more about Kierkegaard. Um, so, can you just break down what the leap of faith is, like that 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 concept, just briefly, and then we can kind of go into uh, the pros and cons because uh, that will be interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. You know, again, what's important with with approaching Kierkegaard and asking again those kinds of questions. You know, what does he mean here? Um, there's so many interpretive elements to keep in mind because Kierkegaard at times will speak intentionally paradoxically. Uh, you'll want to, you know, sometimes there's a kind of move in intellectualism I'd call it, where you're reading Kierkegaard, you come across an idea, and it sparks something within you, and you want to pursue it in this consistent fashion. But then you find somewhere else in Kierkegaard where he says the opposite. And a lot of times I find myself getting annoyed because sometimes we can be like what Walter Kaufman called us as like thinking like spiders, where we try to spin webs of thought. And in turn, we kind of get trapped in this complex sort of web over time. And that's what I think Kierkegaard does. And that's the feature of his thought in reacting to the more rationalist attitudes in religion. And so what you see in Kierkegaard's movements throughout the authorship and in presentation of these ideas is that, that there's preparations made along the way. Uh, there's ways in which these stages of existence are progressing higher. There must be some kind of uh, progression, yes, but things have to be in place for this progression to occur. Um, so, for example, in thinking about the, the leap of faith, for example, he never calls it usually by name that leap of faith. Uh, in the Danish, it's probably more accurate to say like a spring uh, you right. know, a, 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 a recoiling, as it were, outward to the infinite. Because mm-hmm. he says that each movement from the stages of existence is itself a movement um, in infinity. But once we reach the ethical into the religious, there occurs this experience of what we call a leap or a spring, as it were, uh, because there's almost a recoiling that takes place in ourselves, and this is to use Kierkegaard's language, whenever we will ourselves in the absolute above the universal. So, in other words, when we look at the life of Abraham, of course, now resorting to fear and trembling, uh, we see this ethical commandment, right? Do not kill. The father is to love his son. Um, And this commandment rubs up against another one of God's commands, which is to sacrifice Isaac. And so now we have this expression of a paradox, but the paradox is only expressed when Abraham wills himself in that alleged contradiction. Um, and so by, in so doing, he doesn't will the good, he goes beyond it, right? So that whole don't murder, love the son and going beyond it, he goes to the realm of the absolute and this stepping over the universal into the absolute, uh, is precisely the kind of leap of faith that Kierkegaard has in mind. It's a leap that only the single individual themselves can make. It's not that it's anti-rational or that it doesn't make sense whenever the paradox is uh, appropriated by reason that's when it doesn't make sense but as an existential category um, it's it's just that the absurd you know that above the universal is what uh, you know reason doesn't have access to and one place Kierkegaard says that this that the absurd that boundary point over to the absolute is where reason honors faith it's kind of like bowing its head and saying I cannot go over there and comprehend what's taking place, but I will nonetheless, you know, bow my head in, in service to it. And so um, that's essentially what's going on with the leap of faith, that there's this progression or stepping over um, these requirements of the good into that of the absurd. Because whenever the, you know, as I said before, when the religious man tries to express this inward God relationship in an outward fashion, the world's going to laugh at him. He's going to look ridiculous. In fact, he's going to look insane, uh, as Fear and Trembling kind of argues, unless there is a God, right? 
Uh, and I'll just finish here in saying that if God exists, the leap of faith is either a leap of faith or it's just a jumping off a cliff. Um, you know, you're either going to hit the rocks and you're done for, or there is something beyond, uh, there is something after that really exists in this willing oneself in the absolute, willing oneself in the absurd and the paradox. Uh, and that's kind of the hard point, I think, for some Kierkegaard commentators to come to. Anyway, so. Yeah, um, and like you were kind of alluding to, the biggest criticism <clears throat> that I could think of, of the leap of faith, I mean, you know, there's the concept, but also it embodied, so to speak. And mm. it is that, you know, once you make one leap of faith, you then make excuses to make another and another and another and another. And that can lead to you making some pretty um, foolish decisions down the line, you know, because then you become accustomed to um, abusing the principle, which is, you know, that, yeah, sure, reason can't explain nor even navigate the area of which we cannot know, um, or yet, let alone ever. Um, but, it, but it is, you know, by Kierkegaard's definition, at least, it, it is a rational decision considering that unless you believe in strict materialism and, and scientism, you know, he understood that things, some things simply can't be explained materially mm. speaking. And, and that's fair enough. But, but when it comes to more, I suppose you could say fundamentalist types who do, who take one leap and then another and another, you know, like the um, young earth cr creationist and so on, like that's when it's an issue, but that's, obvi that's obviously not, that's a mutilation of Kierkegaard's idea in some sense. Um, I'm wondering what, what you think about that. Yeah, I definitely agree, and I'd, I, would take, I would take a moment to kind of flesh out my thoughts on this. But there's a way in which whenever the absurd um, or the leap of faith is conceived in that kind of way, there's a kind of repugnance that's associated with it. And it really gets down to this issue of the relationship between the temporal and the eternal. So this goes back to the idea that like concepts have to be consistently in place or there have to be preparations had for this to occur. Sometimes people get these pre this order of preparations backwards. And I think with fundamentalist types, young earth creationists, uh, you know, biblical literist, if you want to include all these people under this kind of camp, they bring the eternal down. They kind of rip it down from transcendence and majesty into the world of the particulars. And I think people are not reacting to the eternal, to the transcendent, but they're reacting to those moves of finitude, those moves of bringing it down and trying to say, no, here is God uh, amidst these, you know, these fleeting, these, you know, these circumstantial happenings. It's a, it's a cheapening of the divine, a mockery of God, if you even want to call it that. And so... Um, one important way in which I think Kierkegaard, again, is used in this conversation is that he's a missionary to modern Christians. That's my favorite title for Kierkegaard. Um, you know, usually there's this incessant preoccupation to be an evangelist concern for unbelievers, right? We want to get people in the church. We want attendance. Uh, but, but by looking outside of the church, we aren't looking at the church, you know? Uh, we lose sight of the inner happenings or movements within the religious life. Uh, such that there's a greater danger there in us not looking at these moves to finitude, right? These bringing down uh, and not knowing that it's happening in our, in our own house, as it were. Um, so if that answers your question, I think in any way, it's just, it's just a way of insisting to be, uh, you know, an introspective and keeping yourself always in view um, in the mm. happenings of the religious life. So, yeah, no, well, no, I, I think you succinctly, um, uh, yeah, went over that. I, I think, you know, speaking as an agnostic atheist myself, it's mm. it's interesting because the leap of faith, I, I like I've alluded to, I, I do think it's a good idea. I do think that it's um, a reasonable way of thinking about things. Although at the same time, I think, you know, the danger is to what extent are you ready to make a leap? And that mm. is where it gets really, really technical because then you come into questions of, you know, not only God's existence in general, but but the standard of evidence that you apply to of which you believe, whatever you might read um, or interpret or, um, you know, it, it, whether it be uh, scripturally or, or through, um, you know, particular arguments, cosmological, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I, you know, it's interesting because when I debate or when I discuss um, 
with religious um, individuals, you know, Muslims, Christians, whatever it might be. Um, what I do find out actually is that the standard of evidence is one of the most important questions to pose because mm. basically it's a question, well, what it, what would it take for you to believe mm. um, in God or, or at least this particular argument or how could it be better? Yeah. And I think that is a really, really fundamental way of coming to terms with, well, also understanding the opponent that you're talking to because, you know, mm. Matt Dillahunty is famous. All right. Um, yeah, we... <laughs> my wi-fi cut out at a very convenient time um so yeah going back to what i was saying um yeah basically as an agnostic atheist uh, finding it you know more difficult to comprehend the idea and, and different standards of evidence um hopefully that will record it i'm sure it did um but yeah the the uh, and when i was citing matt dillahunty um what's interesting about him is that he he even says that he doesn't know what it, what it would take to believe in the uh, the, the resurrection, right? Mm. And and you know <laughs> he's been made into a meme, um, capturing Christianity. Good channel um, has mm. talked about it. Um, and you know uh, and what what was interesting is at first glance I was like actually yeah that does make sense. Like he doesn't actually know what standard of evidence it would take for him to believe in it. But then I was like well to be fair we've never come across that situation, um, materially speaking. Um, mm. And like, who is to say what what we would, what to expect, I suppose, and how, and how to even prove it? I mean, I know, I know for one thing, and I'm sure Matt Delhunty would agree and concede on this point, is, is that historical evidence alone, and maybe this is going a bit off topic, but this is all stringing into the same point of the leap of faith. But I, I feel like Christians, let's say, have to, have to really make a leap of faith because of course it, it's a cumulative argu argument as um, William Lane Craig would say of mm. course it however the the historical Christianity relies on on Jesus right it relies on the resurrection and that's right. that's a make or break part so whilst it is a cumulative argument um <laughs> it definitely hinders on Jesus so if the Jesus res you know if the if the resurrection is in pieces um then Christianity is no more in a sense or the validity the validity is no more so so yeah the bedrock of Christianity is Jesus and because the documents are by definition historical what we have to agree with here is that basically that leap of faith in this instance is trusting historical sources from 2000 years ago that whilst yeah you, you could say are cross referenced in some sense but you know even if I were to concede that, which obviously is a contentious issue in general, how well the you know the cross-referencing is and, and all that kind of thing, that's contentious. But even if I was to concede that, I, I still wouldn't change my life around based on a historical set of documents from 2000 years ago. Mm. Um, I, on a personal level, I, and I, I've looked a lot into this and it's just, I, I, and I still am, but at the moment it just feels very, the leap of faith there, you know, is like, of course, you could say, well, it's not so much faith because you've got the documents and and yeah, but you have to have the faith that those documents are not only legitimate, um, but you have to also believe in many other constituents of of that entire theory. Mm. Um, although I don't buy the Muslim um, critique of that, that he was body swapped. Um, mm. I'm not quite convinced by that, in all, in all fairness. Um mm many reasons why the Quran wasn't very convincing to me, but one of them was was definitely that. And Pascal, as I said, even even went over that, which was really interesting when I read his work. Um, but yeah, hopefully that wasn't too much of a tangent. My point is, is that oh, there no. are different standards. There are different standards of evidence um, in these disciplines of thinking. And what I usually get down to is, OK, okay well, you clearly have this different standard of evidence to mind because the, the person I'm talking to might believe that, um, you know, historical documents is enough to convince them that Jesus is resurrected. Um, or, 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 um, or, you know, on, on the Muslim side, um, the, uh, the, the visions that Muhammad had of Gabriel, you know, so there are leaps of faith, I suppose, in that sense. And, and what my position is as, as an agnostic atheist is, and this is why I have sympathy for the leap of faith concept, um, because I have come to the point of agreeing that the material realm, it would be arrogant to assume that is all there is. Um, 
and it would also backfire myself if I was to say there's no uh, material evidence to say that um, that isn't true because of course it, it will be contradictive like I can't demonstrate that there that there isn't more mm. so I shouldn't come to the conclusion that there isn't so it's like um, you know so, so I, I think that these issues lie on both sides but yeah the standard of evidence thing really comes down to it you know what what you are ready to believe um, and I just happen to be very strict to be honest I, I happen sure. to yeah I, I, I just happen to be predicated on material evidence mm. things that can be uh, consistently observed um, in historical documents whilst I'm ready to believe that Alexander the Great existed um, mm. I, you know the, the, the differences between Jesus um, resurrection and Alexander the Great existing is that you know a historical figure existing has happened before you know mm. we have loads of documents of people um, being alive and doing battles but what has never happened before is a literal resurrection it, it's never it's never been physically demonstrated before that somebody can resurrect from the dead um, or at least since 2000 years ago although some people do claim that they have which have clearly been debunked quite fast but is that a testament to their fault it's the time of which they came out as this happening i i would yeah. You know, it, it get it gets very slippery because if the same thing happened with Jesus nowadays, it's 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 just an interesting idea. Of what what would be the response? And there will be a lot of doubt. Um, but also, and you know, and I, what what I've thought about is, well, you know, we could just see the walk him walking on water, and we could have independent sources, um, scientific measurements saying actually, there were there were no platforms underneath his feet. Um, they, you know, in the water, um, th th there's no magic going on. Well, sorry, there's no magic trick going on here. It's, you know, it's it's real magic, paradoxically speaking. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that would be much more consistent, although. And in the future, though, I, I do I do concede as well that and I think you'd agree um, that people 2000 years from that happening let's say in the modern age they would doubt the same way that we doubt the documents from 2000 years ago the only difference would be i suppose mm. would be the technology that we document things with but i must admit now and i'm just going back on my own argument here because um i think it's a really interesting concept but i i, I do think though it's interesting to consider and, and this comes back to the epistemological point which is well, how can we really be certain? Because in 2000 years, you could doubt the technology that we have now that we believe is ob objective. So, and, and back then, of course, um, 2000 years ago, originally, um, what was objective to them, as far as they were concerned, were historical documents and, and their writings, cross-examination um, uh, documents. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully this is, this is relevant, but again, it's, it's about the standards of evidence and how we make those leaps of faith. I would be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, going in the course of kind of your discussion there, there's a lot of thoughts that came to mind because, you know, as I keep saying throughout this conversation, there's a lot of ways to approach, a lot of ways to begin, things to consider. Hmm. I think in being presented with that kind of life view, let's just say, you know, doubting or being unsure or agnostic about the reality behind the resurrection, my treatment of that problem wouldn't so much to be look at the material constituents uh, I mean, they help to a degree. They might bring you to a point of decision, but you are still being brought to a point of decision as to where the evidence leads. So, for example, one of the things that I was obsessed with for years was uh, this issue of religious epistemology. So when you look at the arguments for God's existence, uh, even the you know historical scholarship pertaining to the resurrection, theologians, scholars, historians, everyone will always admit that you're always brought to an approximate point. We get to a first cause, we get to, you know, an ultimate mover, but we don't really get to the divine personality of, you know, the Trinitarian Godhead as Christianity dictates. So I was, I was obsessed with trying to find that link, as it were. What really pushes one in the direction of Christian theism? So for a long time myself, I called myself uh, a Christian atheist or a religious agnostic, if you want to call it that. Uh, there were a group of radical theologians who really took up uh, metaphysically seriously this death of God theology that was permeating through Nietzsche uh, and saying that God really died on the cross and that this took place in a kind of apotheosis. Anyway, I got weird uh, in this problem of religious epistemology. 
And it hit me finally in a, in a culminating moment when I was reading N.T. Wright, his big book on the resurrection of the Son of God. He says that when it comes to the resurrection, historians can say nothing because the resurrection is a, is a transcendent event. And mm. historians yeah. as such you know, cannot speak on transcendence. And for a moment there, there was a way in which my own rationalism, my own need for objectivity kind of experienced a sort of despair or anxiety in thinking that like, well, the evidence the evidence got me this far. Uh, you know, we at best we can get a probabilistic case. What am I supposed to do with probability? Mm -hmm. And so Kierkegaard, as I encounter him in his whole problem, his solution is to say that, again, it's kind of a joke. Because believing in the resurrection is not relating yourself to historical documents from 2,000 years ago. Because what does it mean to say you'll lay your life down for Christ or you'll lay your life down for Christianity, but you'll only approximate your certainty in like a 50-50 kind of way. Like you aren't certain, but it's probably true. Uh, it's you know not to say so harshly it's a joke, but it's just those kind of individuals are what he called comic. Comical because there's a distance between their uh, – it, their passion, their interest in the things of eternal blessedness and happiness, uh, but there's still a distance between the two. And he says it's tragic because the passions are involved so deeply in this issue. And so I don't think that this is a problem that agnostics or unbelievers have. I think Christians are having it as well uh, in having this incessant need to find uh, justificor justific justificatory proofs you know, minimalist facts, maximalist facts, the usual conversation, uh, because you're going to get to a point in your experience of Christ where he asks you, who do you say that I am? Um, you know, there's a certain instance in Matthew 16 where Jesus is like, guys, so give me the word. What is everyone saying about me? Like, what's the word on the street? Some guys are like, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist, a good prophet. But then he turns very seriously and Diverting away from the opinions of the crowds, right, of what is the chatter, what is the gossip, and he goes to the single individual, Simon, or Peter at this point, um, or, well, Simon at this point, to be named Peter, and he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, son of the living God, and he says, blessed are you, uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So the problem of Christian experience is to similarly recognize that these sort of things are not revealed by flesh and blood. Um, you know, the material evidence are only going to get you so far. Jesus mm -hmm. had a body. Jesus had a way of representing himself. But there's still a disconnect that must be made in this act of faith, as it were. And so this leap of faith, uh, I mean, let's first and foremost, I guess, just kind of clarify that it. It doesn't make sense, but it's not supposed to not make sense as such. You don't remain in, you know, in nonsensicality, as it were, because the absurd of faith is not like other absurdities in life. Uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre had a more comprehensive view of the absurd. He said it was just that which is meaningless. And, you know, all of life is meaningless insofar as there's nothing externally justifying you know, there's no goal or finality by which human experience is oriented to. So everything is absurd. But Kierkegaard says there's only one real absurd, one real encounter that we have with negation. And in our experience with God, it's the same thing that Shakespeare says. We either have the choice to be or not to be. Um, and all philosophies of life, which don't go to that direction of being, all end up in negation, uh, you know, kind of nihilism proper, as it were, a philosophy of nothingness where their essential personality is subdued, you know, yada, 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 the whole story of existentialism. But um, yeah, that might be a weird kind of way to phrase the problem or to kind of react to it. But I think in summary, I would just say that, you know, after a certain point, the evidence only helps so much. Even with your knowledge of the evidence, it could assist you in coming to a decision. But the richness of you know, faith experience, if there even is such a thing, uh, comes through that point of decision. Um, so anyway, like I said, probably a weird way to put it. A lot of Christians here and there are going to be like, yo, that's nasty. Uh, don't listen to what he's saying. He's probably a mystic, you know, a fideist or an anti-rationalist or what have you. But anyway. Well, I, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it would be easy 
to say it's anti-rationalist, but that isn't the way that I view it. And and, mm. it's, and I view it similar to, of course, what, what you've been describing, because, you know, on one hand, yeah, you can say it's not this certain, it's not this certainty and it's not this scientific method, but, but the very definition of transcendence negates all um, equivocation to materialism uh, in general. Mm. So, you know, it isn't asking to be, to be investigated using scientific uh, methods at all mm. um and that, that i mean i guess that's one of the biggest mistakes you can make really it's to equivocate the transcendent with the material mm. you know expecting expecting um material evidence to um make a case for something that is by definition not on that same platform right and look and and you know when i go back on my own thoughts on that and when, when i my my daemon is um or was it socrates is is in a daemon but when i when i speak to that to myself mm. it's like yeah that that's true but it's kind of a cop-out because how you know you you could say the transcendent is equivalent to uh fairies and then you have to get this whole then you have to think oh well okay okay on principle that's true because the transcendent isn't something that you can immediately experience mm. or, or so or so you could claim i mean some would say music and and other things but but that would be mm. you know there might be a case for that but but generally speaking the transcendent is something isn't something that you can immediately experience like you can um picking up a a, a physical object right mm. and so and so whilst on principle that's true you have to give you have to give credence to the idea that there is more to it than that you know that that, mm. that there is that there is a leap of faith circling back that there, there is an element of you get so far with how much material evidence you can come up with but there has to be at the end of the day you deciding to make that step to something that is non-physical and something that negates your again immediate experience because I, that that's the common that's the issue isn't it it's it's for me at least it's taking that step from the physical to the non-physical mm. yeah and some could say consciousness um is non-physical you know i mean in a way that's true um the brain is physical but what it projects is arguably non-physical and you know love for example um uh, some some theologians like bringing that up um that love is a chemical reaction and you can measure it but I suppose there's something more to it that negates your reason. I mean, love by definition is irrational. Mm. And in that sense, mm. you could you could equivocate it kind of with the leap of faith because we all engage with taking for granted elements of consciousness and love, for example, but we but we reject the 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 leap um to believe in a god. And of course, the answer to that is well, <laughs> well believing in a god is is much more of a burden um than falling in love or something like that you know it, mm -hmm. it's literally if you take it seriously of course it, it changes your life um or at least it can mm -hmm. and so and, and that's one reason why i'm just very careful because you know i don't want to i don't want to sort of be flippant with how i think about it uh, for right. that very reason um nor do i want to be flippant with my atheism which is why i've sort of um you know recently my agnostic atheist is is the preferable terminology that i use i i don't know whether god exists or not but based on what i know and understand to this point i'm not convinced that god mm. does exist whether that be um uh, allah or, or or you know the conventional uh, western idea of god christianity what, what, yeah. what it might um do you have any thoughts on that or uh, yeah, a number of things to say. One of which stood out to me immediately is that, you know, typically in modern philosophy and conversations about these big subjects, there's usually this kind of split that takes place not only in being but in the very being of man, right? There's this distinction in philosophy that emerged, right, between doubt and certainty, like that kind of preoccupation with trying to obtain philosophical certainty, right? The things in themselves, the noumena that Kant was after, right? But there's this split, this otherness, this unlikeness, this non-identity uh, between mind stuff and matter stuff. Uh, there's two substances, at least this is Descartes' configuration, um, 
you know, there's mind and matter, there's body and soul, there's flesh and spirit. This kind of dualism, this split within the person that is seen all through, you know, primarily through this tradition of Plato. Plato, Augustine, uh, the ancient heresy of, you know, um, uh, Manichaeanism, uh, looking even at, uh, you know, Descartes, uh, Immanuel Kant, up to Sigmund Freud. There's this this split, this distinction, and one sees this not only at the psychological level, the microcosmic level, but at the macrocosmic level as well, um, such that this distinction between transcendence, God's otherness, and this idea of imminence in the world, right? As modern philosophy takes up this split, transcendence starts to take a backseat, and now philosophers become more concerned with imminence, being in the world. And so there's this preoccupation to want to find the reality of God or come to a knowledge of God's essence through this imminence, this particular sort of, uh, you know, uh, infatuation with the world. And so it emerges, I think it culminates in this philosophy of life that we see in Hegel, for example. I don't want to get too abstract. I'm going to explain this point and then, like, like I said, question me as, as need be. But he talks about this idea of philosophy needing to hand itself over to the sciences. Because philosophy and the arts and poetry keep us in the sort of clouds. We're concerned about the general, essences, natures, universals. But science brings us down into the particulars. So that he talks about this, this need for philosophy to hand itself over to science. Or that is, philosophy needs to be more involved with scientific systematizing. And it, again, it goes to this view of, of doing philosophy, of looking at the world, and even being religious by ripping down <laughs> transcendence, bringing it down to the world of the finite, and suggesting that there is no love apart from the acts of love. There is no beautiful apart from the music of Bach or the poetry of you know, Byron. That the essences of things and their particulars, their phenomenal experience, they're always one in one. But I think the problem with this view of life is that it's attributed to this split between essences and material things in other words we want to get at one for the sake of cutting off another as it were so to be kind of oddly persistent um, i don't think religious experience entails you moving away from the physical to that of the non-physical i think faith is more of a kind of sight an intellectual vision by which the by means of the body and things of phenomenal experience the the essences, the universals, the nature of things really emerge. And this is kind of what is getting at, uh, you know, as to having a relationship or an experience of God. Uh, because for Hegel, all of this kind of philosophizing kind of ruptures into a pantheism. Uh, really, you and God and love and spirit, we're all one. Our individuality kind of becomes subservient or gets smoothed down into the system, right? But Kierkegaard, as well as Nietzsche, are considered to be philosophers, uh, those who philosophize with a hammer. Uh, they're system breakers. Uh, and I love these kinds of thinkers because they really step into this philosophical edifice, this tower that we want to be comfortable in to look at the world and, you know, think that we know better. But then, you know, our pride is cut uh, by these kind of philosophizers with hammers. And so... Um, I don't know. There's a, there's a way in which I would invite not so much this split between the transcendent and the material or the imminent, uh, but to kind of find a way in which they're uniquely integrated. Uh, you're becoming a new creation or becoming new if you, for example, were to become a believer, is not you being endowed with these alien or otherness qualities. Uh, there's a way in which your authentic personality becomes re-expressed or redoubles, is what Kierkegaard says. Um, anyway, I'll stop there because I've been ranting too long, but um, it's yeah, it's clarifying um, it's clarifying an important aspect of faith experience. Anyway, mm, the, I, I don't know who says it. Maybe it is Kierkegaard, maybe John Lennox. I, I can't remember, but one quote sort of says that faith doesn't eliminate reason; it supersedes it. Mm. And I, you know, and as as I said, look, as somebody who doesn't or who is not convinced of uh the existence of god you know I, I do give credence to that idea in a vague sense because like we've been discussing there comes a point where something becomes so nearly invasive to you so invasively evident to you mm. whatever way 
whatever means, um, that to deny it would be maybe breaching on the unreasonable. Mm. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's contentious to what extent would it be unreasonable. But but I think that the main idea that we can get from this discussion is that, you know, faith for me isn't, it doesn't seem to be a cop out as much as the new atheists or you know pop atheism mm. uh, mainstream atheism likes to like likes to proclaim it is um I, I think that of course we take leaps of faith every every day um now obviously and i think i've wrote about this recently um maybe i haven't published it yet i don't know i've been doing a lot of writing recently but mm-hmm. but but i i you know I, I was thinking about this thing because you know a lot of people say, well, we take leaps of faith every day uh, crossing the road. But, you know, I, I wouldn't say that isn't because there, there's a caveat to that. We do. But it's a measured leap of faith. There, There is a measurement to that. Like, of course, you don't know for certain that a car isn't going to swerve around a corner when you even look twice. You know, we don't know. But there comes an element of probability, and and this goes full circle into KKR, the leap of faith. What we've been saying um, is that there comes a point where you have to understand that certainty isn't actually what we're after, and it's not even what we believe on on a general basis. We just believe in probability, and in a in a in an interesting way that circles it all back to us actually agreeing. Or when I say us, um, an atheist and a, and a Christian. Um, in the general sense, um, that probability is actually what we all agree on. Like, mm. like you know, a Christian might um, say, yeah, well, I don't know for certain, but as far as I'm concerned, the probability is quite high. And the atheist could say, well, I don't know for certain, let's say for me, but the probability is this or that. And 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 I think the consensus is that dealing with certainty is actually just ignoring nature as as itself. I mean, what, what is certain, you know? Um, the only way that we measure something scientifically is, as I alluded to before, consistency. But mm. just because something's consistent, that doesn't eliminate the fact that it could not happen the next day. Right. Right. So it's, and I think that a lot of these people who are behind science, quite adamantly behind science, they don't, they don't necessarily grapple with that because they're like well if it's consistent then it's considered to be a fact and sure Mm. a fact could be whatever we could agree it to be but that fact is rooted in probability and Mm. and and again going full circle right to the end right to the end here um it it is yeah probability and and our standard of evidence (laughs) to what extent are we ready to have this certain standard to believe in this and that and yeah i, I want to do i want to try and do more thinking on on the standard of evidence part and, and work out some things around that because you know as i said i am quite strict with my standards of evidence because mm. i much i much prefer consistent material standards of evidence you know that, that i could see observe and even though i know that they are not it's not based in certainty, but it's based on a very, very strong probability because it's right in front of me. For all I know, it, it is true. Um, whereas the historical document, let's say, um, uh, thing I was discussing earlier, it's like, yeah, there, there is a certain amount of um, probability there. And, and there's a certain, obviously there's some faith there because you have to believe that certain things were genuine. And so... The leap of faith, you know, this is what it all strikes within me, this leap of faith. And ever since I read it and I did a review um, of it like last year or something um, when I read the piece. Um, and it, it's one of those books that really made me think a bit differently about. About faith mm. in general, because it look, again, it isn't this surrender of reason that these pop atheists like to say. And I want to repeat that. It's not this surrender of reason. It, it is if you take it intellectually like you do and, and you know, people, I mean, sophisticated theologians, I mean, we, we can we can all agree that the fundamentalist types have their issues. But those who are seriously dedicated to their uh, theology and their, and their study of these issues, um, they, they, they do think about it intellectually. 
uh, like David Bentley Hart, like, you know, mm. I, I was watching Riley Morgan and uh, Eric Evans discussion um, that just came out like today. And they were talking about like David Bentley Hart talking about hell. Um, and it's interesting because David Bentley Hart, <laughs> I think he says himself that he, he relates more to atheists than uh, fundamentalists. Mm. In, religious fundamentalists, because at least with the atheists, there is some level of what well in some cases of course not all but there there is typically some case of wanting a discussion where at least some kind of rational um idea is predicated whereas you know fundamentalism they have their own set of rationality and mm. we don't need to go into that but but yeah i mean basically the leap of faith for me and fear and trembling for me is a testament no pun intended to to how the idea of faith is isn't frivolous is actually a sophisticated concept that um i don't think atheists actually give enough credit for mm. so i'll just leave it at that yeah no i think that's a fantastic way to put it um yeah i don't know there's a lot of things i could probably say with but one thing i think i'll finish with is that you know i think there are many names by which we can know god and oftentimes in our disputes as to whether or not he exists, we're often concerned with, you know, his name being attributed to truth, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there are other names that we know by God that we don't often attribute to his being or essence, such as beauty, uh, such as goodness or wisdom. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people know God in different kinds of ways, some just as an object of truth, others as just a kind of precept, something that keeps their life in order, others as just something they experience through song, through poetry, or what have you. But I think uh, becoming an integrated self, coming into a deeper knowledge of yourself, really entails this deeper uh, God knowledge. But um, knowledge of God in itself uh, is not what is sufficient for this faith experience. So that's my kind of insistence that, you know, faith is something much deeper than things which are known. It's more of a life uh, kind of category. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Um, God bless you yeah. for your time. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, yeah, we could, we could leave it there. Um, if, if you feel like we've covered the, um, the main themes, I suppose, the leap of faith and, and, and some of Kierkegaard. Um, and let, do you have any additional, um, ideas, um, of, of what interests you about Kierkegaard or anything worth looking at? Any, any of his books? I mean, yeah, let's, I guess we can end with this. Um, apart from Fear and Trembling, which other books of his would you recommend and why? Yeah, very, very difficult to read Kierkegaard, as I said. Paradoxical, um, uses language that just is almost flies over your head if you don't have any kind of uh, familiarity with it. And so, and really understand, it's important to know Kierkegaard the man before getting into the writings of Kierkegaard. So often one thing I'll recommend is to read his autobiography, which was published against his own will. He wrote it in 1848, 1849, but it didn't get published until after his death. And even in journal entries pertaining to that biography, he was like, man, I shouldn't have wrote this. Uh, people are going to know too much. It expresses too much about the secrets of you know, my authorship and all those things. So it's a very important book to understand what's going on in his philosophy of communication. And that's what I'll probably finish on is why I love him um, because it's been a, an approximate or distance love because he's a great writer. He says cool things about God and love and sexuality. But my deeper understanding of him didn't come until about two years ago when I dove deeper into his uh, philosophy of religious communication. And one point radically in his journals, he says that we need to introduce into theology, into dogmatics, a Christian art of persuasion. And he says essentially that we need to look at this relationship between conviction and probability. Um, and so this gets him to talk about uh, improbability as well. And how we can still find conviction amidst the improbable or the absurd. Um, so he talks about this idea of indirect communication. Uh, again, I'll finish here, I promise. Which is something that persists all throughout the, uh, the authorship. It's a beautiful, brilliant idea and basically saying that the contents of faith of you know, what's going on in a believer's life cannot be directly communicated. They can in a you know, in an incomplete and an imperfect kind of way, insofar as we're talking about theology, but as just far as like communicating religious experience, it can only be communicated indirectly, he says. So that's why he invokes these pseudonyms. 
So Fear and Trembling is written by uh, Johannes de Salentio or John the Silent. Um, or, you know, we have the concept of anxiety written by Fagilius Hoffniensis. And these pseudonyms are Kierkegaard's indirect way of communicating sort of the secret life of spirit, as it were. And so when I entered into being an author and a writer, I was looking into, you know, how does one perfect this indirect communication? How do I discuss things of the spirit and all this kind of stuff with other people who I want also to know these things? And Kierkegaard is one philosopher that I know of in the modern you know, period, um, really, you know, all throughout Christian history, who has this exhaustive philosophy of religious communication. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's impressive. In his journals, he has a whole outline. Uh, he has sermons and lectures prepared for discussing how this is to take place. And that's kind of my obsession with trying to understand Kierkegaard. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think you I think you emulate in some sense um, a lot of aspects of his character through how he writes um, and and of course how you share the information as well. I mean, as mm. mentioned before at the beginning of the discussion, you you yourself do do uh, videos and and lots of you know writing as as you said yourself. Um, so yeah. I, Thank you so much for having this discussion with me, Stephen. Um, for the first time as well, it's a, a pleasure uh, to have you on the channel. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, so we, we can end it there. Thank you. No, absolutely. Bless you. Thank you for your time, uh, for having me on here and listen to my musings, as well as your audience, if they sat through the whole thing, to hear me ramble <laughs> about this stuff. Um, God bless you. Thank you for taking the, the time to, to sit down with me. So I really appreciate that. No problem. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Absolutely, brother. Tomorrow, right? I think we're sitting down with Eric and all them. Yeah, like tomorrow. Well, we are as a group. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's being recorded though. Is it? Is it being recorded? I can't remember now. I want to say probably not, but um, it, it would be cool to record anyway. I don't know. <laughs> I might. I might just ask if we can, just to just yeah. for keepsake. I don't know, but um, anyway, yeah. I'll I'll see you next time, and uh, I'll keep in touch. Yes. Bless you. Thank you Bye. so much. Yeah. I'll see you again soon.